50 years before the term was invented. We had typhoid epidemics in Philadelphia and Baltimore and places like that. We had chronic and mass underemployment, chronic and mass poverty. We had um, all that sort of stuff. Um, all the diseases of poverty, tuberculosis and malnutrition, rickets and the like. Uh, I remember as a kid, tuberculosis and rickets and all, those were still, those were still uh, diseases to be dealt with. The great American prosperity, America as the land of prosperity, is a myth. It, was, it didn't exist. The Great Depression came along. Uh, at the same time, Western Europe, those great wonderful social democracies like, like Finland and, and Denmark and Norway and Sweden, and like where life, where life and social services have been better for a while, they were third world countries too. People were living hard and, and mean lives in those countries too. Um, World War II brought a massive increase in spending in America. There were three things that led to the American prosperity that came. That prosperity started developing 1945, 46, 47, in the, in the 1940s. And that came by, for three things, as I see it. One was the great backlog of consumer demand. An interesting thing started happening when World War II came. All sorts of people started making money. My uncle, I have an uncle, Nick, he was a mechanic, a working class guy. I come from an Italian working class family in New York, East Harlem, which was a big Italian neighborhood in those days. Uncle Nick worked in a, in a garage. He made about $40 a week, which was good money in those days for blue collar working class people. When the war came, he quit being an auto mechanic and he, um, first of all, there were many, many less automobiles on the road. Nobody had, had automobiles. He became, he went to work in an arms factory and was making $100 a week. I mean, $100 a week was unbelievable. The problem was there was nothing to spend it on. Oh, he found, he went to nightclubs and did things. Like that. But even he had a surplus in his lifestyle. Um, you couldn't buy cars because Detroit was now making tanks and planes and the like. You couldn't buy new refrigerators. You had to keep your old one if you had a refrigerator. Many people still had ice boxes with ice in it. Um, my family did, um, and the like. But there, but what it did was, everybody said, when when this war is over, there'll be a depression. In other words, we'll be back the way it was in the 30s. When the war was over, you had this backlog of consumer demand, people wanting things and having saved up money from all the jobs they had during the war. Because the government was spending and spending in a way that, that some of this just trickled down, didn't get around. Uh, that this was the kind of money they could, not, um, they could not spend it during the Depression itself. They couldn't spend that much, but they could spend it for war and killing. Um, the, second, the, the second thing that happened, besides this great backlog of of people wanting homes too, and and and, and they say all these con durable consumer goods and the like. Uh, after World War II, there came what was called the GI Bill of Rights. I remember there was constant talk about what happened to our veterans after World War I, and constant little pictures, old photographs and such, of veterans of World War I standing on the corner selling apples. And the word was out, are we going to let our boys come back from, from the Pacific and from Europe now this time, and we're going to make them stand on the corners and sell apples again? And Congress was really swept up in this thing. And, and so they passed this remarkable legislation, the GI Bill of Rights, uh, which really, unlike the GI Bill today, which is so miserable, so, so meager, so deficient, <coughs> that guys come back for a GI and they, they volunteer in the army in the hope of getting these GI benefits. They come back and they get them and it's not enough. They have to, they have to borrow money. They have to take extra jobs and the like. It's very disappointing. 
The GI Bill back in 1946-47 was a terrific deal. You got a stipend, a full amount to be able to live on, and you had all your tuition paid, and it was, uh, nobody had to run into debt, nobody had to take a second jo a job, or this or that, or anything like that. And the GI Bill took about um, nine million, nine million Americans came back and got the GI Bill. Many of them got trained as professionals, as artisans, as skilled workers, as all sorts of things, going into businesses. I know a friend of mine, a florist business, his father, his old Italian father had a florist shop and he learned new ways of doing bouquets and all this stuff and, and advanced the business and so forth. There was an incredible, an incredible shot in the arm when you inject it with all of these people who are better trained, better skilled, capable, ready, willing, and, and doing all this kind of work. So you had that, the backlog of consumer demand and the GI Bill of Rights. And then the third great stimulus was the giant military budgets that by 1947, Harry Truman was pushing a military budget that was, it wasn't as big as World War II, but it's as big as we know now. It is, uh, and, and led to the building of an enormous armaments industry, which, which kept a lot of those top paying jobs for blue collar workers and such. So you put those two, those three things together and you got this dream about the ordinary worker living the middle class life. He now had a little ticky tack house in the development. He had a little car uh, and his kid could go to the state university. That was terrific. Uh, this was like something that he or his grandpa could have only dreamed of doing. Um, and that prosperity lasted until 2008. It started going under attack in 1978. In 1978, which was the beginning of the third year of Jimmy Carter's administration, a uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce guy commented and said, we have got to roll this back. We got to stop it. That we are becoming a social democracy. Now, these guys understood the term social democracy. There's only about four or five hundred people in America who understand the term social democracy and are familiar with what it means. The social democracies we use that term to mean Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Holland, to some extent France, and Western Europe in general. Uh, it is countries that are, that are capitalist, but the private, the public sector has been expanded and is, um, <clears throat> is creating a social wage that is really helping, helping the people, uh, you know, health care, guaranteed free health care, uh, affordable housing programs, uh, job programs, and, and all, all that kind of stuff. That was, that was the social democracy. Paid vacations, good wages. That same emergence of a social democracy was developing and emerging for the first time in their history in the social democracies in Western Europe also. And there they had another impetus. They had terrible destruction from the war. It wasn't like the US, which was very prosperous and had, hadn't lost a single house in, in World War II. Um, but they had, they had something else. They had this other enormous impetus. They had the Marshall Plan, the US sending them millions of dollars to reconstruct. And they had Soviet troops along the Elbe River. And there it was, all of Eastern Europe, where you had countries where people were, had guaranteed right to a job, uh, guaranteed free medical care, all of these things under communism. They may not have had the freedoms that people might want, but they had these other things. And that became the big competition. That also became a competition in America. Again and again, U.S. spokesmen would get up and say, we have to demonstrate that our people can have, have a decent living and this and that, and it's much better than what the poor people in communism. They never allowed, they never admitted that the communists had a good living and all that sort of thing. But the same thing with race relations, they say. It's, it's disgraceful. We're going to lose the battle for men's minds if we don't improve. Uh, much of civil rights, many of the civil rights liberals would start off every time they got up and they would 
and they would have to say, if we want to win the Cold War against the communist adversary, and most of the world you know is not white, it is black, brown, yellow, whatever, tan, whatever the different hues are, uh, and, um, and, um, and those people will not believe us and they'll turn toward the communists unless we get rid of Jim Crow and unless we uh, build a, a, a more equitable life and civil rights for people of all colors. Uh, so the influence, the threat, the competitive image of the communist countries was another impetus that led to, um, a, that spurred them on and, and, and it led to what was called that, what was that called, the, the great historic compromise with American labor. And American labor would come in and there wouldn't be this class war anymore and labor would get its cut. All right, your boys will get a contract if you work three years under these conditions, right? And, uh, and you'll get, and you'll get, um, You'll get vacation time from now on. You'll get an eight-hour day. Finally, you've been fighting for you've been fighting since 1920 for an eight-hour day. I mean, say from 1900 to 1920 was a ten-hour day they were fighting for. Now they're fighting for an eight-hour day. We're going to give you an eight-hour day. You're going to get time and a half overtime. In fact, that was done in the New Deal. Some of these things were even done during the New Deal. Again, because of the threat of revolution, the Communist Party in America had 100,000 members. There was all sorts of lefty groups coming, agitation of all kind. Um, they made certain kinds of concessions. We gotta, we gotta let you have this. Not only get a vacation, you get vacation with pay, you know, and, and that was the way it was going. And things were getting <clears throat> improving again and again. Well, there was that element within American capitalism <coughs> that was saying, this is too much, when is it going to stop? We don't want this social democracy. And in 1979, that year I told you about, Reaganism began. Back in those days, in 1980, when Reagan won and was president, I said Reaganism came in two years before Reagan, and that was under Jimmy Carter. He immediately increased the military budget, he started cutting back on uh, the social wage, on, on benefits of various kind and the like. Um, and so, so there was this uh, rollback. A couple of years ago, I was reading in the New Yorker, and there was a GOP leader, and he said, things are pretty good. Our goal was to roll back the social democracy. There's that word again. These, guys, these Republican leaders know about social democracy. They never used the term publicly, but they use it when, when it's a question of the class struggle that they're waging against us all the time. He said, that was our goal, and we've succeeded. We have succeeded in rolling back the social democracy. Well, they, they've rolled back quite a bit. I mean, life is very tough, and getting more raw, and more raw, and raw, and, and the like. Um, if you ask George W. Bush, it wasn't completely rolled back. He said just a couple of weeks ago, did anybody see that? He said, my administration was a success. He got what he wanted. He, he, he said, he cut the taxes on the rich. He rolled back all these government regulations and controls. He, uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't mention this, but he got involved in the, in the war in Iraq and, and led to enormous spending. He, he, he more than doubled the, uh, the uh, military budget in America. He said, but I have two failures, two things I left unfinished I couldn't accomplish, and that was rolling back Social Security and Medicare, uh, which is admitting a lot. And we got a guy in office right today who said Social Security and Medicare, I'm talking about Obama. He said Social Security and Medicare are on the table. They're there to be bargained in and uh, trimmed if we, if we have to or not. Social Security, which is the most successful anti-poverty program America has ever had, uh, is on the table. And in Western capitalism, you got the same kind of thing happening, you know? They, as I said, they had to make all these concessions here with this, 
this, this uh, wave of communist countries and, and, and giant communist parties in France and Italy agitating and such. They were making all sorts of concessions, vacations and social wages and working wages, minimum wages and medical care and this and that and so forth, and pension rights and the like. Um, now, today, that's being all rolled back in Western Europe uh, under the guise of austerity, under the guise of the crisis of the system. They're using the crisis of the system itself as the bludgeon to force working people to now uh, make sacrifices and get rid of the social democracies. And that's their goal in Spain, Italy, Greece, and uh, pretty much anywhere. So you see, recessions can be a weapon and a very useful one. Recessions are not such a bad thing for the 1% at the top. Mitt Romney, did he suffer much through this past recession? Did any of his five sons, all of whom have multi-million dollar trusts, did they suffer very much in this past recession? Did they show any signs of suffering? I, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, I didn't spend too much time with them. I, 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 I don't really know. I don't really know, but... Um, but it's, a recession is not really so bad for the big boys. It really isn't. Um, a recession is a form of mass poverty, but it's not bad for the big boys. Otherwise, we wouldn't have so many of them, you know, if it was bad. Recessions tame labor. Labor gets tamed. Un labor unions get broken. Labor unions settle for miserable contracts, almost next to nothing. Um, Recessions uh, tame individual workers. All sorts of people line up for jobs today who would not have imagined working for those wages just uh, five years ago. Uh, <clears throat> Small businesses are bought up at bargain prices, in, and even big ones. Big businesses swallow big businesses. If you study media, media ownership patterns. They don't just buy small independent radio stations, newspapers. I mean, you've got big businesses buying other, other big, huge businesses. Um, you see, the 1%, the 1% also does not want a well-educated, self-confident public. They don't want a public, a work, potential workforce with a developed sense of entitlement. They don't want people with high levels of expectations. They want us hungry. In that sense, recessions are quite useful. The hungrier you are, the harder you will work for less and less. Why do you think Indonesians work for 17 cents an hour in Indonesia? 15, 16 year old girls working for 17 cents in a Nike factory to make those shoes that Nike then brings over here and sells you for a real bargain for $200. Shoes that cost them eight or nine dollars to make. Even with all the outsourcing and all that and transportation costs. Why do you do that? Do they do that because they're so concerned about you? That's some bargain, man, $200 for these shoes. Wow, that's so cheap. No, that's not cheap at all, that's very expensive. But um, well, why do they do it? It's to increase the margin of profit, to diminish the cost of production and keep the price high and fancy. Um, so why is it the US, why is it US workers don't work for 17 cents an hour? Is it because we're so much more self-respecting than the Indonesians, is that it? Or is it something else? It's that we are at a level of historical struggle where we don't want to and don't have to and will not work for 17 cents an hour. But the goal is to get us down closer to that number from where we were. The goal is to get rid of those benefits and paid vacations. And uh, more and more jobs now are just contracted. There are no benefits, nothing. You just, the hours you work, you get paid. If you're laid off for two days, you're off for two days, there, and, and the like. Um, <clears throat> so, there's real method in their madness.
the um, and by the way, all those signs were coming. That crash of two thousand eight. Before that, the, the, the seven or eight years before that, there already was another six million out of out of a job. I got those figures somewhere here. Six million just in those few years. The Dow. Um, Right, six million out of the job. Median family income had declined by two thousand dollars, which was a lot of money for modest income families. Seven million people lost health coverage in that time. The consumer debt more than doubled from from two thousand and three to two thousand and eight. Compliments of uh, of George Bush and Dick Cheney. Um, so. But it was okay with the guys at the top. The Dow Jones was up at record high, and the banks were making more money than uh, than Santa Claus. So they were having a great time. Um, <clears throat> Another myth is that capitalism fosters democracy, and that I'm just going to laugh away. Every democratic gain we have made, it's been with the opposition of that ruling class. The ruling landed, merchant, banking, investing class opposed the abolition of, of uh, property qualifications for voting. They opposed that. They did not want to abolish. They, they supported property qualifications. They have always fought to limit, to limit the number of people who can participate in democracy. We see that happening right today with the voted, so-called voter fraud things of uh, you have to have proof that you were born here and this and that, and using these things. They've disfranchised, they figure, several million people in, uh, in various states um, here in the U.S. Um, they've never thought that people should be doing much with government. If you look at every elitist from ancient Greece with Socrates right on down to Roger Sherman, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, all of them saying the people should not rule, the people who own the land should rule it, and, and the like, very explicitly. And today, too, you see all sorts of undemocratic laws being put in, suspension of habeas corpus, mass arrests, use of torture, Use of FBI for illegal use of surveillance. These are all these are all instruments of con the conservatives. Their goal, in fact, is to put hamstring and limit democracy because democracy does not um, serve. When democracy is successful, that creates problems for free market capitalism. Um, okay. I think I got a whole bunch of other things to talk about, but we've been. We've been going long, uh, as long as long as we can say. Let me just say something about this. The free market advocates insist that everything works better in the private sector rather than the government sector. Therefore, we should have government run more like a business. So, you know, you and I might wonder, how could that be possible? Exactly what businesses should government be run like? The 50,000 firms that go bankrupt every year? Or the large successful corporations themselves? Giant bureaucracies, recipients of billions of dollars in public subsidies, bailouts, payouts? Uh, with big multi-million dollar salaries to every agent head? So the Secretary of, of Transportation now should make a 10, 15 million dollar salary? That, if you want to run it like a private business, CEO, he's the CEO. <clears throat> if we run government like a business, who would take care of the costly nonprofit public services that the public demands and business itself demands? Operational expenses are generally less in public bureaucracies than in private corporations. Administrative costs for the uh, U.S. government's Medicare program are under three cents per dollar. That's socialism in action. Three cents a dollar administration. You're always, you're taught that, oh, bureaucracy is so wasteful, is this government is wasteful, corrupt, blah, 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 and the like. Administrative costs for private, 
profit health insurance are 26 cents per dollar. That's capitalism in, in action. Poor service at higher expense because the explicit function is to extract profit. It's not to give good service at low cost. Social Security has been more reliable and less expensive as a retirement program than private pension plans. A Roper poll asked Americans to estimate the administrative costs of Social Security as a percentage of benefits. So they're so used to being told that government is so wasteful, respondents said, well, Social Security administrative costs, I would say um, 50 cents, 50% 50 of their budget is for administration. Actually, it's 1% spent on administration. That's socialism in action. By comparison, the administrative costs for private retirement plans are about 13% of annual payments. Public utilities owned by local governments offer rates averaging 20% less than those charged by private power companies that operate for profits. That's socialism. What do you have here? Do you have a public utility or a private utility? We've got a private utility, we've got an election to get a public one. We're having an election right now yeah. for, for a public one? Yeah. Yes. Very good. That's great. Uh, the most expensive one is PG&E, where I live in, North, in North California, Northern California. PG&E spent $2 million in lobbying and transferred $5.1 billion in profits to mo the most affluent stockholders and executive heads over a three-year period. That's capitalism in action. But now let's look at some public utilities. The one in Palo Alto transferred $7.3 million uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the, their local government budget. PG&E transferred zero to the California state budget in Palo Alto. The LA public utility transferred $124 million to their uh, local governments. That's socialism in action. They made money. Uh, they not only gave you lower rates, but the money they made they put into the budget, which would then keep your taxes down and, and, and help you. PG&E has given nothing back to the communities. It all goes to their stockholders and such. The capitalist leaders want to eliminate public spending programs, not because they don't work, but because they do. That's why they want to get rid of public utilities. They work fine. They demonstrate that this thing could be done cheaper and at greater return for the public and such. Um, that's why they're destroying the U.S. Postal Service and, and, and inflicting upon it a terrible, uh, go to Common Dreams and uh, Jim Hightower has a good article on, 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 on the, on the uh, post office. The post office isn't going broke. It wasn't, it's not, it's not dwindling. It's, it's handling more mail today than it ever did even before the internet. It may not, not as much first class mail, but an awful lot of junk mail and such and, and other stuff. But uh, I call it junk mail. I mean, it, it serves some, some, well, yeah. some service sometimes. Um, but but they, they've been forced to raise $5 billion a year for a pension fund for workers that haven't even been born yet. It's for the next 70 years, they're supposed to finance this thing. It's a way, literally, of, of underfinancing and stripping and destroying the US Postal Service, and that's what they're doing. Um, and they're doing that because it works. You tell me, you tell me what private postal service, what private postal service in this country will deliver door to door from here to New Jersey, let's say, a, a piece of mail to my Aunt Tessie, me, for 45 cents. What, what private company will do that? Nobody. You know what your mail will cost if you want to send somebody a birthday card? Is, well, you're not going to send it over the, over the internet. But, but, but there are people who still do that. Uh, it'll, it would cost, it's going to cost quite a bit. And that's what's wrong, that, that is any kind of service that outperforms the public, uh, that outperforms the private corporations shall be, um, shall be uh, attacked. 
And that's why Social Security is being attacked, that's why Medicare is being attacked, and so forth. These represent threats to profit markets. So, there's a bunch of other things I wanted to talk to you about, but I've gone on too long. Let me just tell you about, as far as the environment goes, there was a cartoon in the New Yorker uh, a year ago. It showed a guy at a business meeting, you know, he had a lectern here and there was the tables and people all sitting there. 